recording. Hey guys, I'm um, just waiting for people to arrive and then um, we're going to start, probably give it another one or two minutes. Some background music on whilst we wait, because why not? <laughs> question we can all think about whilst we start the session. Like how's everyone's day been out of 10? Nice, we've got seven. We've got 7.5, all right then. 6.5, all right, like that. Fun but stressful. Okay, that's cool. I like that. Nice to see you again, Teddy. All right, welcome everyone. Um, BJ here, CEO at the Personal Project. Um, as many of you guys know, I've been an entrepreneur for over 10 years. I've started over nine different side hustles that have turned into businesses. Some have done really well, some haven't done so well, but the key behind all of these businesses growing and thriving has always been having the right amount of capital. Some of the businesses I created have needed capital from external people and some have self-funded. The topic that we're covering today is something close to my heart as you don't know what you don't know, and it's a very much a journey. Um, in today's conversation about raising your first investment round, I'm hoping to cover topics around how to prepare for your rate, for your fundraise, how to set goals, um, how to speak and connect with a lead investor, figuring out how much you should raise, talking about building an advisory board, um, how to comp them if needed, and then how to close the deal. Um, there isn't going to be one answer for everyone, but I hope the panelists today can kind of give you guys a selection of different things that you can take away and make it as practical as possible. As always, please use the chat function and the Q&A um, option to kind of ask questions. This is being recorded, so it's not just to the people here in, in the audience now, it's also with the wider community and also being live streamed on our socials. So um, whether you're tuned in on the Zoom, whether you're tuned in on our socials or whether you're watching this after, I hope you really enjoy this session. Um, background on some of the people who are speaking, we've got Kirsty, who is a principal at Jam Jar Investment. Um, they literally have backed a lot of your favorite brands that you see today, from companies like Bulb Energy, Deliveroo, Babylon Health. Um, we've got Neil, who's head of equity at Swoop. Um, they help founders find funding for their startups. Um, I first came across them when I had an e-commerce business last summer. Um, and then you've got Adrian, who is head of investment at And Rising. They work alongside partners like Jonathan Trimble, Rob, Ward and she's going to hopefully break down some of her history of working in the space across fashion, finance, FMCG for the last 15 years. Um, everyone who's on a panel has a slant, different edge around how to work. I think and Rising also have an agency side, so you no know, money is not always straightforward. So I hope you guys enjoy this panel. Uh, without further ado, I want to bring Adrian up to the stage if you'd like to join us. Right. Thanks, Adrian. Um, so do you want to share the floor a little bit? You know, I, I gave a little brief bit, but I really like people giving their context of who they are. Do you want to tell us a little bit about you, what you do day to day now? Um, and maybe just go into the questions, but let's start with a bit about you and what you do. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Adrienne. I'm co-founder of Anne Rising Ventures. Um, thanks so much, uh, first of all, for having me on the panel today. So we'll share a little bit about my journey and hopefully some helpful advice. Um, a bit of background on my role and um, 
our company. So Anrising is a creative ventures firm. Um, we invest in early stage companies. Our focus is on brands that champion positive change. So typically clean, conscious, creative D2C products and services. Um, our investments include brands uh, like Hard Seltzer brand Served, uh, plant-based dog food brand Hound, uh, refillable beauty brand Fills. I know you guys were speaking to um, on the podcast this week as well. Um, our background and expertise are in brand and marketing. Um, so having run agencies and worked at and with brands across most sectors, it's fairly unexpected that we've kind of ended up in investments. Um, we launched and rising ventures nearly two years ago and LA rising, which is a specific LA fund um, this summer. Love that. And Trash, leave you on the floor to answer your three questions. What you wish you what what you wish you knew when you started talking about some of your favorite business models, and um, maybe get some context about finding the right investor. Sure. So, um, what do we wish uh, we knew uh, when we started? Um, if we look back at some of the brands we've helped scale, um, Pop Chips, Love Film, which is now um, Amazon Prime. Clear score, sweaty Betty, Duolingo, seed lip, um, and consider if we'd taken a blend of equity in return for our services, um, it definitely wouldn't have been a bad decision. Um, this model is called creative capital. Um, it's a model that we operate all of our investments under. It's better known as sweat equity. Uh, it brings value and expertise beyond just cash. Um, so we typically take on about five to 10 investments every year. Um, so I guess if we started this 10 years ago, we'd be somewhat further along with our portfolio. Um, patience is a virtue. Uh, it's taken us many years to get to the right model and exciting value proposition. Um, so we've restructured and built products and capabilities alongside the brands that we've partnered with and invested in, um, in addition to all things brand and creative, the fastest growing areas of the other side of the business are social commerce and growth marketing, media buying, um, all disciplines needed early on in a brand's journey. Um, in terms of a bit of macro context, as much as 70% of a raise can be for marketing and marketing resources. So it's very much an alternative and supplementary option to raising part of your first round or early stage rounds. Um, creative capital typically works better at seed and series A, where you're incubating, uh, helping incubate a brand, um, where kind of early acceleration of, the, of brand um, and investment into that brand can give you a competitive advantage um, in a long-term platform to build the brand and, and grow from. Um, so it should be very much viewed as a long-term investment. Um, the hurdle for most is that they can't afford to put money in at an early stage. Um, and one of the most, into brand, one of the most common mistakes that we see in the early days is the desire for a brand to hire a marketing team fairly quickly. Um, I guess we would say cash for resource is probably nearly always better spent. Um, on smaller amounts of expertise that have a bigger impact um, to fuel early stage acquisition and proof of concept. Uh, so we're always interested to see what brands are forecasting in their, in their investment decks um, where they need to spend resources in the first couple of years. Equally, the agency world is a bit of a minefield. Um, so it's difficult market to shop. Um, we've found some of the greatest appeal of the creative capital model is having skin in the game and a long-term partnership based around joint success. Um, I'll talk a little bit about um, business models we like um, as well. So like most, um, we love recurring revenue models. This is probably not a big surprise. Um, the benefits of, of a recurring med revenue model is it takes a little bit of the pressure off the constant need to acquire new customers, um, which can often be expensive and much more costly than retention. Um, slightly cynical, but humans lose track of time. Uh, this is definitely a benefit of the subscription model. Um, and people actually, they want less choice, um, more reassurance. So if you can add real value and real upside for your audience, 
outside the obvious kind of receiving the product and the service when you want it. Um, this is definitely a huge benefit. Um, Amazon Prime is a great example of this. Um, interesting fact, uh, more people put Amazon Prime in the US and put up a Christmas tree, which is I think roughly eight in 10 American households. Uh, so when we're talking about recurring revenue models, it's really hard um, not to mention Amazon Prime. Um, the real value for the audience is um, in their range of products and, and services that they offer. So it's, you know, delivery, it's entertainment, it's, it's rewards, but, you know, this upside could be anything depending on the category you're operating in and, and your, your particular business model. It could be personalization, it could be content, it could be cross propositions that are really meaningful to the audience that you're engaging. Um, most of the time, you know, for us, we're looking for the potential lifetime value. Um, so we think that's a more considered metric than just looking at CPA. And I think CPA really only offers you a kind of short term, a short term view. So definitely encourage everyone to look at um, look at lifetime value as a, as a key metric. Um, and then the last question um, is around investor chemistry. So how do you know if it's the right investor for you? Um, we definitely believe in the value of expertise beyond capital. We've worked with lots of businesses and lots of interesting characters across the years. Um, so I think for me, you do get an instant reaction in the first few minutes of meeting someone when we're looking at um, investment decks, you know, in the early stages, you know, you, you sometimes don't even, even get to a meeting, but assuming that you, you can get through that barrier, um, I think, just because you've got, you might like someone or you have some initial good chemistry, it doesn't mean that it will affect the potential investment opportunity. But in a world where, especially in seed investing, there's a lot of unknowns. Um, I think for us, going with your gut is as good a reason as any. Love that, love that. Thank you so much, um, Adrian. I wanna bring up our next guest, Neil. Um, and we'll bring you back up in a minute, Adrian. Hey, Neil, you're on mute at the moment, sir. Hi. So, give us a little bit of a, you know, one-two line on, on who you are before we get into your... your yeah. Uh, my name's Neil, and I'm head of equity at Swoop Funding. Um, just a bit about Swoop Funding. It's a, it's a platform that helps um, SMEs and startups get access to funding, so across debt, equity, and grants, and then pretty much everything in between. My focus for the last two years has been helping startups and founders get um, introductions to uh, investors and hopefully getting that investment. Um, and we also do a lot of support around that, providing guides and um, templates and things that they can download. And then also time with us to talk through pitch decks and all the different marketing materials and things like valuation and things like that. Um, so yeah, I in those two years, I've seen a lot of pitch decks. I'm sure Kirsty can has her own story of how many she's seen, but or, or Adrian as well. Uh, but I've seen well over a thousand and viewed them all. And then um, we've helped some of them, this, a select few, um, get across the line and, and get started with their business. Love that, love that. Um, I'm going to leave the floor with you. Um, obviously, you've yeah. got a few questions we're going to tackle. Um, I look forward to checking in again. Cool. So the first one was, um, how do you prepare for your first round? Uh, the first thing I'd say here is to, to make sure that um, you're actually a good fit for equity investment. I think sometimes equity investment uh, and, and venture capital investment is heard of a lot. It makes the paper. You hear of unicorns and all the big tech companies probably started, not all of them, uh, started with some uh, venture capital investment. But many, many businesses uh, don't start like that. And it doesn't mean they're any worse or better businesses. And um, less than 1% of startups get access to venture capital funding. So that's just one place to start. And then really understanding what is meant. So some startups are meant for that really scalable. They need a lot of capital uh, to scale. Um, but it's good to know all the different options out there. So just, just to give um, an example of what a startup really is focusing on, is it like the 
a startup in the modern sense generally refers to a business that is searching for a product and a business model to bring to market and they're focused on rapid growth and, and scalable growth and um, so just make sure that you need this money to grow and that you can convince an investor that this is really scalable and there's a big enough market there for you to grow into and um, so just before i go on I, I would mention some of those different types of funding so you might go to grant funding which is obviously a type of equity funding and um, so that's still kind of along the same model as venture capital funding but you're going out to a wider audience and you're hoping that most of the time the consumers that would buy your product are willing to invest in you. And it's a great way because they become your biggest advocates. Um, and then bootstrapping is a, is a great uh, way to do it. And it really, this can prove to an investor at a later stage that you're really invested and that, that this business is really worth investing in because with very little capital, you were able to bring it forward. So uh, BJ, you mentioned that uh, you invested your own savings. So that's kind of one way of bootstrapping or then going out and selling and making some revenue and then getting that back into the business and growing it that way. Obviously, then there's family and friends around, your angel around, sweat equity is mentioned before by Adrian. But then also a major one that people overlook is, is grants. Um, and Swoop is a good example of this. We've received, I think, over four grants um, and up to over six million or seven million in grants. Um, so we've almost at every stage. So that's something you'd look at. So yeah, to get back to the the question was to prepare for your first round, just make sure that you're you're ready for equity investment and that you should be either at the same time exploring different options or maybe exploring those options before you go to equity investment. Because as you know, you obviously have to give away a bit of your business. Um, and then one of the main other things I would mention is preparing for your first round is knowing about the two biggest tax schemes in the UK. So SEIS is the Seed Enterprise Investment Scheme. And this applies to businesses that are two years and younger from the first from the date of their first commercial sale, and they can raise up to 150k under this scheme. And what this means is that an investor, um, and often it can be several, but an investor who invests 150k under the scheme can write off 50% of their investment against their tax bill that year. Uh, there's no capital gains tax uh, on the profits, and there's no inheritance tax. So it really de-risks an investment in your company. So what I would suggest is going to get advanced assurance from the HMRC. You can get an accountant to do it, or we often um, refer people to the likes of Seed Legals and they can turn it around within a month. So this means that um, you're just a much more enticing investment for uh, an investor because they're, they're going to be able to write off some of that investment. EIS is very similar, but it's just like the big sister. It's Enterprise Investment Scheme. And that is... Um, from seven years or younger from your first commercial sale, you can raise a business can raise up to 12 million in the lifetime of the business or 5 million in any given year. So, uh, and, and the only difference is for the investor is that they can write off 30% against their tax bill, uh, but the rest is all the same. So get your advanced assurance, put it on your pitch deck, probably your last side when you're asking for whatever funds you're asking for. Uh, and just to mention that so many funds that we work with have sprouted up because of these tax schemes. They're for the they're the best in the world for this sort of thing. So um, yeah, avail of them. Uh, other last two things I'll mention would be get your pitch deck and uh, your materials or your pitching materials sorted. We always use um, a five to twenty slide pitch deck or fifteen to twenty slide pitch deck. But you should have a one pager. You should have a more detailed business plan or a longer deck because maybe in that fifteen to twenty. You want to show the problem, the solution, the um, your forecast and, your, and the team and things like that. But you might not give away the secret sauce until you actually go and meet um, the, the investor and you want to really wow them with that and then give more detail on how you're going to go to market and, and maybe the, de the specific details of, of how you're going to spend on marketing and things like that. Um, but really make sure that they are in tip top shape because they're really important. Um, and then start early would be a main thing and, and keep track of who you're talking to. So early uh, at the start, you really, you might just have a conversation, but you should really keep notes. You should write that down somewhere. I've had a first conversation with them that might get you the first um, email and, and hopefully they'll, they'll answer that and get back to you and just keep that relationship going until you are ready. So there's no harm in starting early. Um, and yeah, like uh, keep a proper track. Um, 
yeah, I don't give a plug for Swoop, but we, we help do that. Um, so I'll move on to the next question. Um, it's, it was, uh, what, what should you uh, not do um, or what should you do or not do uh, when approaching an investor? Um, this is maybe more specific to uh, the pitch deck, but uh, don't overdo it with too much information. Uh, I think I, meant, I just mentioned before, you don't want to give too much away, but unfortunately, investors just don't have enough time to read a 30 to 40 slide pitch deck. Um, and we actually track the amount of time that uh, the investors look at the pitch decks that we send out on, on the founder's behalf. And they spend on average about two and a half to three minutes, maybe three and a half if you're lucky. So you got to be concise. You got to get your point across really quickly and um, really wow them with the, just a few slides. And then later on, once you get that first intro, you can go into more detail. Um, but yeah, I think 15 to 20 slides allows you to get all the relevant information across without overwhelming the reader. Um, another thing I'd mention, uh, don't forget to research and compare yourself to competitors and hopefully say why you're better. Um, saying that you don't have competitors in the space is never goes down well. I've seen it before. We obviously, if they come through us, we would tell them not to do that because while you might not have a, a direct, direct competitor because you're doing it in a certain way, there's always a different way that a consumer could spend their money. So they might be an indirect competitor. It's, it's not a great look when you're saying, oh, we don't have any competitors and we're going to um, take the world by storm. In very few cases, that, that is the case and good for them. Um, but most other uh, mere mortals do have competitors in the space. Um, and one of the, one of the things uh, that we've come across with founders, when they've come to us after maybe doing their own networking and their own, um, they've got a few term sheets and things like that, but for whatever reason, it didn't work out, was I would say don't mess around, mess uh, VCs specifically and any investor around um, and, and always be honest because um, uh, Kirsty and, and Adrian can speak more to this, but th they have WhatsApps, they have different Telegram groups, they all speak to each other. So just be really honest, be a great founder. And um, if, if you're, if you come across like that, then other people will say, even whether they're going to invest in you or not, they might recommend you for investment for another person, or they might just say, have nice things to say about you as a founder, which can get around the, the community. So yeah, that would be one thing I'd say. And then the last question for me was, when is the best time to start a relationship with an investor? As I said, start early. So as soon as you can start speaking to people, the better, I suppose. But Having said that, it can be really time consuming to do all that networking. So um, you maybe want to wait until you're somewhat ready to present yourself to an investor. Uh, for the most part, before then, you should have been grinding away to get your business in, in a, a good shape. Now, deciding when your business is ready for an investor is kind of a difference. It's different across industries. Uh, we get lots of consumer brands coming to us. And if they haven't gone out and sold any of this, and got some done some proper market research well then that's going to be really hard for us to get an introduction to an investor and um, because they need to show some traction because there's no real reason why they shouldn't be out there and um, selling the product uh, as, as long as it's not a, an airplane or something like that where you'd need a lot of capital but other industries where it's more technical or engineering focused you may be ready to do it when you're just about to get a patent or when you have a patent and um, or you're doing your first round of testing because uh, you get investors that are more ready to, or they're more willing to get in on the ground floor because they know that this is a capital intensive industry. So it really varies across industry. So when is the best time to go? But uh, you, you should know. And, and the, the key performance indicators, your KPIs will be different for that industry, but showing some decent traction depending on your industry is, is pretty important. Um, yeah. But as I said, some it won't be as important. Um, and then the, the other thing in terms of timing kind of links to what I was saying about the tax schemes, SEIS and EIS. Um, if you start speaking to someone in, in January and February, it gives you that two, two months time um, to build up the relationship, get those introductory calls. And generally, these SEIS and EIS funds, they do more deals at the end of the tax year, which is, I think, just the start of April. Um, or, or end of March. Um, so for whatever reason they do that now, I, I 
under those tax schemes, you can actually do a carry back. Um, so it, it's, it shouldn't be like that, but it is for whatever reason. So it's quite seasonal. Um, and I, I just mentioned the timing there of it, it you're not going to get a deal done in, in a month really from when you actually go out to investors. It might take, <clears throat> sorry. And um, it depends if it's under SEIS since your first 150 K you might get it done in six weeks if you're lucky, but really you got to give yourself a decent runway and realize that it might take you three or four months to do that or, or even longer. Um, I hope that was valuable. I, there are the three questions I had. Super valuable, Neil. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'm going to bring you back in a minute. I'm going to bring cool. up Kirsty now. Thank you. Thank you. Literally flying through this. Hope everyone's enjoying themselves and getting their questions in. Um, hi, Kirsty. Hey. How are you? Yeah, thanks. How are you? <laughs> not too bad, not too bad. Um, so you work at Jamjar, which famously has been founded by founders who have done really well. I know that you guys have a really strong um, policy around the kind of startups you cultivate and the scale-ups you work with. Um, do you want to walk us through a bit about what you do in your job? What does it entail being a principal at an investment firm? Yeah, of course. And um, just before I start, I'll apologise for how I look because I have to run back from the network training for this. So I normally look a bit more presentable. Um, it's a Zoom world now. It's a Zoom world, Kirsty. It's all good. <laughs> um, yeah, so I work for Jam Jar Investments. Um, we are the Innocent Drinks Founders Venture Fund. So we were set up in 2013 after Innocent exited Coke. Um, the story of Innocent is that it was founded in the late 90s by Adam, Rich and John, who are three of our four partners. Um, they tried to raise a round of investment of, of about 200k um, back then, and they were turned down by everybody. Um, in the end, they sent an email of their entire address book just saying, does anyone know anyone rich? Um, and actually, it, it kind of it got to like a friend, girlfriend's boss, who was like a rich American angel, and he said he'd do the round with his angel syndicate. Angel syndicate said no. So this guy kind of did the round more out of courtesy than thinking it was good investment decisions. So, so basically it was, it was really close to never happening at all. Um, and it was actually the only outside investment they took. Um, so they closed that round, they ran the business for 15 years, lots of ups, lots of downs, eventually exited to Coke for um, half a billion. Um, and we invest a portion of those funds alongside um, some other funds we raised from um, institutionals and, and, and corporate investors um, into early stage consumer facing companies. So early stage is typically kind of pre-seed to A, so investing kind of 500k up to um, 2 million pound checks in the first round. Um, and by consumer, we mean anything with consumer brand, both tech and non-tech. In reality, 90% of what we do is kind of tech or tech enabled in some way. There's some kind of digital element because that's where a lot of the disruption is. And the remaining 10% is the kind of classic retail offline brands like Innocent um, that, that, that you kind of know, know and love. Um, so our portfolio includes Deliveroo, uh, Babylon Health, Bulb Energy, Tony's Chocolony, um, Small Products, um, Pot Chips. Yeah, there's, 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 a, there's a few brands in there that I hope you guys have heard of. Um, yeah, so that's us. Awesome. Well, I'm ha we're happy to have you. Um, I'm going to pass the floor on to you and hopefully you can answer your questions. Set the floor before I bring uh, Neil and Andrew back up. Yeah. Um, so one of my questions was, was how to prepare for the first round. I'll, I'll try not to repeat um, Neil too much because he had some really brilliant points, um, especially around making sure that you're a good fit for equity investment. Um, Jamjar tends to look for businesses that we believe can exit for over 100 million. So that's not every business. And that doesn't mean to say that you can't build a a brilliant profitable business that, that exits for less than that. It just means that you don't necessarily kind of fit Jamjar's strategy. So um, I think it's a really important point that, that Neil made um, because we get a lot of businesses that actually just aren't quite the right um, fit for, for VC investment. And like I say, it's not, it's not a judgment on them. It's, it just doesn't necessarily fit our strategy. Um, but, but the points that I was going to cover, are, uh, one, I think be really clear on your on what the business does and why it's materially better than the current solutions in the market it's actually amazing how many pitches we get and it's it's not you know you get kind of 20 minutes into pitch and, and the founder still hasn't actually said what the business is or why it's better um so just being able to explain it clearly and succinctly and you know be really 
be really obvious on, on why it's so much better and, and why consumers or, or, or your customers are going to pick you over the competition is, is, is super, super important. And, you know, what comes into that is obviously innately understanding your competition and, you know, echo Neil's, Neil's thoughts that if people say, oh, you know, there's actually no competitors there, it, it's a bit of a turn off because some there's, you know, even if it's not direct competition, there's normally something that, that can be seen as indirect. Um, the other point I would say is that really know your numbers and metrics. And I, I mean this by your current metrics and, and where you currently are in the business in terms of, you know, and, and Adrian talked about earlier in terms of kind of CPA and LTV, um, if you're post-launch at least, um, and just, just really be able to recall them well and kind of um, answer questions around those topics, but also be really clear on your projections as well. So know where you want to be in a year um and in two years if you raise the money um and, and make sure those are realistic projections so you know we had a business the other day that that was telling us that they were going to make 95 percent ebitda within a year and it, it that's just not going to happen um so i think just just make sure that once you have built the business plan make sure that you do sense check it that you know it, it's not completely insane um, both in terms of kind of market penetration, um, like revenue you're going to get to, the profit you're going to make. Um, so often with these kind of business models, you you know you build a lovely, elegant model, and then you put in what you think are realistic assumptions, and it spits out something that's kind of completely unrealistic. So I think just just getting somebody to sense check those figures and and, and know them really well, and be able to kind of um, you know put put yourself behind them is is really important because ultimately investors are investing on that plan that you're going to deliver that plan so you really want them you want it to be a realistic plan that you can deliver otherwise it's going to have issues down the line um the other thing i would say is 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 approach your raise strategically so i think and again neil kind of alluded to this a bit but um identify the, the funds that are the best fit for you so for example we only invest in consumer brands it's amazing how many companies approach us even in their b2b so I think just do your research on, on, on what funds and, and what angels are out there on the market. Do you think you're a good fit given, given your kind of business model and your product? And then spend some time before you kick off your actual fundraise, building relationships with them, having some introductory calls, just kind of saying, hey, we're here. We're not raising yet, but we will be soon. But this is what we do. And then try run a proper process. So, so what I mean by that is make sure you have all the kind of first partner meetings or, or kind of first calls and initial meetings with, with the funds or investors roughly in the same time period so that you're kind of moving through the process similarly with all these funds. So, so that will build a bit of competition. Um, and honestly, investors, nothing makes investors move more like FOMO. So if you can basically get to the point where lots of funds are kind of competing for you at, at the same point, that will expedite your fundraise and, and hopefully push up your valuation as well. And the one thing I would say about that is, is, is when you arrange your first meetings with, with the funds that you like or the investors that you like, put the ones that you really want to get, you know, at the end, at the end of that kind of first meeting period and put the ones that you're less bothered about at the, at the beginning of the first meeting period. And the reason is, is that you'll just, you'll get lots of feedback from these meetings and you can then kind of tailor your pitch and, and change your pitch deck and, 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 the, and your style of pitching so that by the time you get to the investors that you really, really like, you're as good as you can be. Um, and also there's probably some, you know, there's some interest from other funds that, that, that drives their FOMO more. So I think, again, people can be, there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, good practice that's kind of left on the table when it comes to fundraising. It's just about being organized and, and it's really quite easy wins to be honest. Um, and the other thing I would say is, is, is don't get disheartened. Like, you know, it, it's just, it's just an investor's opinion. It doesn't make them right at all. Um, you know, innocent, like I said, was turned down by everybody. <laughs> um, so it, it was really close to never happening. We've got some amazing businesses that we said no to, um, you know, one of our biggest misses is Purple Bricks, which I PO'd, um, so, you know, just because a fund says no, it, it, it really doesn't mean anything. It just means that, you know, they, they couldn't quite get there, but, but somebody else can. So I just think, keep going. Um, the other question that I was asked is, 
what mistakes you see from startups approaching funding. Um, yeah, a couple of things come to mind here. So I think um, investors are lazy. Um, I think kind of Neil alluded to this as well. So I think keep the deck, keep your introductory deck short and sweet, explain the company, what the company does in, in, in two sentences, be just really clear about it and to the point. And along that vein, bring, if you can, you know, bring the product or the thing you're selling to the meeting. So it's amazing how many companies turn up if, if, they're, if they're a physical product company and they don't actually bring the product to the pitch, which, which always kind of amazes me. But even if it's, a digi- you know, if it's a digital product, bring a mock-up, bring anything to kind of bring that to life just to really make investors understand what it is they're buying into. Um, I think also one of the, we often, you know, one of the questions we always ask is, okay, what's the biggest risk with this business? You know, if I see you in, in three years time and you say, Kirsty, it just hasn't worked, what's the reason for that? And lots of founders reply and say, the biggest risk is funding, is that we won't get funding. And, and that's actually, you know, we're asking what the risk is in the business, not necessarily the kind of capital strategy. And it's just kind of, you know, there's, there's lots of businesses we fund and they, fa- and they fail and it's not because of funding. So I think just having a really good answer to that, that, it, that is kind of independent of the VC's decision kind of shows that you've really thought about about the risks there. Um, Another thing that I was thinking about is, you know, your reputation is really key. Neil talked about this as well, but yeah, VCs really do talk. It's a very collaborative industry. Um, You know, accept accept feedback gracefully, even if it's just an opinion, you know, politely chase people, but, but, but don't hound them. You know, they, they are quite busy and, and be consistent with what you say about, say to VCs. So, you know, I had a company the other day that said that a VC had had offered, another VC had, off, had offered on their, on their funding round. I asked that VC, he said, no, you know, it, 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 it just didn't look great for the entrepreneur at all. So, so again, just, just have a consistent line that you're saying, you're saying to different, different investors. Um, the other thing that's linked to this is, is, is don't say that you'll only talk to partners at VC funds. Um, associates get you in front of partners. They are often the people doing the heavy lifting in the VC fund. Um, get them on side. Absolutely get them on side. You know, um, we've had people in the past that, that have been really rude to our associates. And, it, it, and to be honest, they, they've got on a we won't invest in them list. Um, so I think j- just be mindful of that. I, I know it seems like associates sometimes aren't the decision makers, but, but they are very, very influential within funds. Um, two more quick ones there I would say once you have interest try close quickly I think we've seen quite a lot of people um, once you kind of lose momentum on that fundraise it's quite difficult to then pick back up with VCs so I think you know again I've had a business recently where we were quite keen on doing it, but there was, there was a bit of kind of over negotiation and, 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 the, and the, the, the time to close really threw out. And on that period, he then had a, a kind of a, a, a period of bad trading. And, and, and I think it's just, it's just, it's just advice, you know, strike while the iron's hot. You know, when lots of people are interested, when you've got an offer, just get it closed and get on with running your business. Cause every, every you know, hour we take away fundraising is an hour away from your business. Um, and my absolute top tip, which people really, I think, um, often don't do and, and it is a really big mistake, is take a reference on your investor. Like, it, you cannot sack your investor. It's a long-term relationship, especially at Seed. Um, it's amazing how many businesses don't take references. So, you know, ask to talk to people in their portfolio that have done super well. Ask to talk to people in their portfolio that have done badly. Um, reach out to them directly yourselves instead of just being put in contact by the VC to make sure that you're getting like a really unbiased view. Um, you know, we spend a lot of time taking references on the entrepreneurs we invest in. So, so you should do the same as, as um, entrepreneurs to investors. Um, and the final question is, what do I wish I knew when I, when I started? And I'm, I'm going to take that as when I started in VC. Um, oh, that valuation is an art, not a science. <laughs> like, you know, it's, it's all about basically squaring kind of, okay, how much does the business need to achieve its plans for the next 18 months? What, given the kind of roughly standard 20% dilution, that, that varies a, a bit, but, but roughly it's kind of 20% per round. What does that mean about the implied valuation? Given this, do they have the traction and the team to achieve that? 
you know, and do they also have the potential to achieve that? Does it, as in, how big can this business really get? And actually, that that endpoint often drives the initial valuation because it's just what investors are willing to pay for it. Um, you know, if the if the realistic endpoint is only fifty million, it's very difficult to get a strong seed valuation because, you know, that there's a limit on on the return that that investors can make. Whilst if 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 a realistic endpoint is you know, two hundred million. You've got a lot more to play with on your seed valuation. It sounds, you know, when I first started in the industry, I was like, that sounds insane, but it really is the way that things work. Um, and finally, the other thing that massively drives the valuation is, is it's like any price, it's supply and demand. So, you know, if you've got lots of on investors' interest in your company and you, you know, there's only one of you, then that's going to massively push the valuation. So that goes back to what I originally said about run a good process where like you can almost engineer FOMO in that process. That's it. Big gems, Kirsty. Big gems. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to invite uh, Adrian and Neil to come up, um, and then we'll open up for Q and A. So, if anyone has any questions, please load them up. I've taken quite a lot of notes, and um, I've got a few questions to kick us off, anyways. Um, so, you all three of you gave really good breakdowns on the journey that one will go through. You all spoke about your approach and what you guys do like and don't like but definitely what you do like so that people can action it from now um there, there was a point that really resonated in, in Kirsty's bit that I think everyone else can probably also think about which is the relationship building aspect of this you know people do talk and relationships even if someone doesn't invest in you today it could be something that actually does pop up in four years five years six years I've seen personally many of my other businesses um so question one for all of you, which I, I wish I put in the pre question before, but it's good for us to hear is, how do we get on people's radar? You know, um, there might be startups listening right now who are like, this sounds great. I know that, you know, I want to maybe talk to associates or I want to talk to Sweet, but you're not always going to get a chance to talk to head of equity, are we? Um, but like, A, how do we get on people's radar? And then if we can be specific on like, okay, where do associates hang? Or if we're trying to make a good approach to a platform like Swoop, what can we do to really make sure that we're not just like in the pile? So yeah, it'd be good to hear in your businesses and in your kind of line of work, um, what can people take away when it comes to coming on your radar or your team's radar? And um, if it is a person like an associate, where do they hang? And like, how do we make sure people are not feeling like they're, they're being hounded, but they are building relationships? I think that's, that, that's the key point. I don't know who wants to take that first. I don't mind having a stab at it. Um, one thing that I've seen works quite well is, is joining these webinars and asking and um, following up after um, because it means that you're obviously engaged if you are able to talk about what you heard and hopefully learn from it. So if you take away some of the learnings from here and make sure that you've got a great looking pitch deck that's well designed, well, um, very thoughtful and uh you can make a good case for yourself. It's always a good way in the door. Um, and I don't want to do too much marketing kind of for, for Swoop, but like an example, you could, you send it to us. Hopefully we will either, we, we don't really give straight rejections. We're often saying, well, you're, we don't think we can help you right now, either because of our network or maybe you need to go away and, and we give a few pointers. We'll often introduce you to, someone else who might help you at whatever stage you're at so what happens is and, and has happened actually in the last two months we've closed a deal with someone that engaged with us a year and a half ago and they just weren't quite ready yet but those people just keep going they talk to the right people we tell them whatever partners go talk to they go do that and then they come back to us and we say that this person is focused and sometimes we've even we've gotten the intros but it just hadn't worked out for whatever reason but the venture capital uh, investor wants to hear from them in a year's time and we just set a reminder in the diary and say let's get them in front of that investor in a year's time and that has been really good because they, it, it, all, it, investors are all human and if they can see someone's growth they're like oh that's amazing this person is actually really driven okay. yeah I, I would agree with that and i, I think um so we'll, all, you know all vcs have kind of we have invest at jamdrainvestments.com um but you know, it, it doesn't take a million, like, you know, you can, my email is kirsty at jamdarinvestments.com. Please email me after this. Um, my, my inbox is a bit insane, but I promise I will get back to you. 
Um, but you know, just 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 if you can guess people's direct email, you're more likely to get a reply than if you just email a kind of generic email inbox, which might have thousands of emails in there. Um, the other really great thing, I think, is when people say, you know, they might email me and it, it might not be right, but they say, you know, would you like to be on stakeholder updates? No investor is going to say no because they want to know how companies are doing because, you know, they like tracking businesses. I've never said no to a stakeholder update. And, and it's just a way, if you just have, you know, if you just send out updates every quarter to people that are kind of interested in following your company and say, these are things that are doing really well, these things not doing that well, like, you know, these things that can help. That's just a, a really easy way to stay in contact with a lot of people that can then become useful to you down the line. And, and honestly, investors don't say no to that because like I say, FOMO, they want to they wanna, they wanna know what's going on in businesses. Okay. Yeah, I completely agree with Kirsty too. I mean, I've got my mobile number on my LinkedIn. So people, if you phone me and I'm free and I'm not on a Zoom, I will answer. <laughs> um, and, you know, I just try and I try and chat to as many people as possible because, yeah, sometimes when people get in touch with us, their decks aren't in a great place, but there might be this one interesting thing in it that makes you think, do you know what? I'm so glad I took that phone call and, you know, this is actually going to turn into something really great. So yeah. I think it is you know, to the FOMO point, everyone wants to know what's going on all the time. It, there is a kind of slight capacity issue and deals do take a really long time to do. And we don't do a huge volume of deals, probably only do about five to 10 a year. So, you know, some of those things, it, it might be that we close a deal in 18 months after, after we first started speaking. So just get in touch. There's no harm in getting in touch, but, you know, make sure you're not wasting your time and getting in touch with with um, companies that were just their investment criteria is completely at odds with your, it's got, there's got to be a fit. Totally agree. Um, so age old question that is super important for startups, um, scale ups, people just build in is, it's about valuation. It's not a skill you learn at school, right? Um, how, how do you value your business? Like, yeah, um, you guys probably sit on the other side and you're probably trying to bring the valuation down sometimes or trying to meet a healthy middle. But um, from an investor perspective, when you're thinking and looking at someone who has valued their business at a certain thing, what 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 holes are you picking at and what, what things you wish business owners did more, of, more often? So for us, um, I'm not going to be that helpful in this question because, because we always go in um, on a round with other VCs because because we're quite small we don't have the capabilities to kind of accurately work out valuation so that network for us um, you know trust VCs have, you know they work together well you know you, you're often not often going in and around completely on your own so we're very reliant on the other VC partners on experienced angels to help help value brands love that yeah, I mean, valuation is, is like I say, it's not, not, not a science. And, and there's definitely been kind of valuation um, inflation in the last few, few years. Um, you know, no massive hard and fast rule, but, you know, we're typically seeing at the moment, you know, on a pre-seed round um, that, that we're looking at, you know, companies are often raising kind of 500, 500k to a million. Um, they're normally valuing themselves at around kind of three million ish um then kind of seed rounds they're typically raising kind of around two million buying themselves at eight million free roughly to ten million post ish um and then kind of you know post seed rounds you, you, you know, you're raising five you're buying yourself at kind of 15 to 20 and like i say there's, there's no kind of hard and fast rule and, and to be honest like i say it's very driven by what people want to raise, what that if you take a 20% valuation, what does that mean by about your implied valuation? And does the team, the traction and the potential of the business support that implied valuation? And, and the, the competition in the market for that deal. Um, so yeah, <laughs> like I said, there's a real range, you know, like in our portfolio. You know, we funded a, a business that was it was on a four million run rate, and the business and it was valued at eight million. Um, but we've also seen a business that was on a hundred k run rate, and it was valued at three times that. So it's really hard to, to unfortunately bring any kind of real science to it, um, yeah. which is a particularly unhelpful answer, I'm afraid. But 
you know, I'm, I'm constantly surprised by valuations in the market, put it that way. <laughs> and I do it for every day. Especially in the US, I think there are yes, different. a difference between the two markets. And I think they're much more vision led in the States. And so the valuation is really on like, what's the big idea? And, you know, less on kind of what, what is the current state of play? Exactly. And pe- people just want to get into the deals, right? Like, you know, there's been seed rounds valued at 100 million because they believe that it connects it for you know, 20 times that, but based on, on very little. But you know, if that's if that's how you win the deal, that's that's what you can make. And if you were just to chime in, if you were starting from scratch and you just needed to get some idea of how your business is valued, I would start with there's four, there's probably 10 actually different ways you can value your company, but four big ones like the Burgess method, the scorecard method, risk factor, summation method, and then VC method. They're all things that you can find online. And what you do is have a go at all of them. You'll get to like a range for almost all of them and try and pick somewhere in the middle of probably all of them. Now, some of those valuation methods will not suit you if you're a consumer brand or if you're really engineering focused, they just won't match. But hopefully some of them will be useful and you try to pick somewhere in the range. Um, And then another thing, you can use tools like what PitchBook you have to pay uh, quite a bit to use, but there are Bohurst and things like that where you can go in check what industry you're in and the size of deals that have been done previously and see what they value themselves at so that kind of placing yourself in the market so as they said the UK market is different from the American market so just make sure that you're there or thereabouts that's what I would say useful thank you both thank you everyone for that um I mean I think this is quite Simple, maybe one if you can tackle this. Uh, I'll direct this to Kirsty, but just in your definition, um, what's a pre seed and what's a seed? Just in case anyone has heard technical terms, I realized we didn't actually do any breakdowns, any, <laughs> yeah, vocabulary. Yeah, of course. Um, so I think of a pre seed as, as kind of pre product, really. So they've, they've got a kind of they've got a business plan and they've got a, a, a kind of you know, a, a deck and an idea and they've got a team together, but. They need money to build that product. Um, seed, they built the product and they, they've launched and there's some kind of early indication on, on, on kind of metrics, but, but you know, pretty early, like a few months in really, um, probably up to six months. Love that. I don't know if anyone has anything different to say. Chime in now, Robert Holger, please. Cool. Um, a question to everyone on the panel. What are your thoughts on crowdfunding and hybrid raises? So where someone might do a little bit of equity, maybe a bit of loan or, you know, a little bit of equity and a crowdfund. Um, and have you seen it work and have you seen it fail? Just good to have that conversation. Just, a, just one truth that I think founders sometimes find out the hard way when they speak to Cedars and Crowdcube is the fact that you can't go live on those platforms without at least kind of 50% of the investments uh, ready to go. So that might be your family and friends making some commitments before you go live or it might be that you have a cornerstone uh, investor so that's really important that's a realization that because they don't they just don't want to see crowdcube and cedars and you as a founder would not want to see your business sitting on the platform at 10 percent funded and it just doesn't create that fear of missing out so that's just one of the truths i i'd throw in at the start so i'll hand it over to someone yeah sorry go on I think there's quite a lot of PR tactics around crowdfunding and it's, you know, are you setting a kind of lower limit so that it's overfunded, so it looks more appealing? Is it in a shorter period of time? So I think, you know, it's definitely, there's definitely a few tactics um, that help. And, and I would see crowdfunding as being a kind of aid as a, probably not for the, the, the biggest part of your funding, but as a kind of a PR uh, initiative to kind of help raise awareness and some some early loyal fans as well yeah I, I think we've seen it um really work well more as a kind of marketing strategy so to sort of have really engaged consumers um and, you're, and it often works really well you've already got a kind of ready-built community that you can then go out to already so so you know brew dogs a classic example of that um, Monzo, of course, did an amazing, amazing crowd raise. Um, 
so so I, I think crowd raise a kind of classic crowd raise is a lot harder work than people think. So first of all, like you say, you've got to have raised fifty percent beforehand. But then to actually to, to get that fifty percent, that true crowd fifty percent, there's quite a lot of marketing that goes into it in terms of you know the materials you put together, but also in the, basically answering people's queries is almost a full time job as well. So I think don't underestimate the time and resource that goes into it. It's definitely not just you know you put it up there and you just get funded. Um, so yeah. I've seen it work well when there's a ready-made community that can it can you know, quite easily you know really engage fans already that you know you can make them even more engaged. I've also seen seen it not work at all where you know they just haven't done the right they haven't put the right resource towards it and and it's just kind of sat there on on fifty percent and not really done anything. So it's a lot around how how you run that raise and how you you organise it. Love that. This has been so, so, so valuable. I think one of those just, you know, hit the nail on the head. Um, no questions, but it's been very informative, especially for the side of starting a business and open to coaching. Um, so guys, I know that um, time has almost come to a close. We've done a full hour now. Um, where can, well, you've already actually said where we can find you. Adrian, you gave your email and you said your numbers on LinkedIn. Kirsty you gave your email in this. Um, yeah. Neil, how can people find you? Well, Neil at Swoop Funding, but... I would say I see my team and most of the time I'll see them. If you sign up to Swoop and you say equity, it's easier because you'll have uploaded a pitch deck and answered some of the questions that I'm going to have to probably ask anyway. So it's great if you could sign up and we review everything. So nothing falls through the cracks, uh, but you could um, get me on uh, Neil at swoopfunding.com. And um, just a nice little uh, fun question to um, end with i like to ask this all the time because obviously work is always work but um you guys you know have really powerful roles where you can change you know founders lives um it's a role that i don't take lightly you know you know investment is something that helps power a business to become super power um what would you all say were maybe one or two things you're grateful for about the the role that you guys have um and maybe like a little note of inspiration for people who are maybe struggling in their round at the moment um, I would say, you know, I, I used to work at Unilever before. So like huge company, very slow. Oh God. And, I, and now I work at the completely other end of the spectrum. I get to work with entrepreneurs that are really passionate about their business. They're doing really innovative stuff. They're moving really quickly. You know, I'm not an entrepreneur. I'm an investor. And, and I, I genuinely don't think I have what it takes to be an entrepreneur. Like I think what it is, is amazing. Like the grit and the determination you have to have like I you know the, the best part of my job is working with you guys and and that is because I know that I could never be you um so so yeah like I say like that we've got a picture in our office of like a, a, a basically a brain and, and a, there's lots of um speech people saying no 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 around the brain and then in the brain it says yes and like that just came from you know, the guys originally exper original experience trying to raise money for innocent, everyone said no. And, and eventually someone did say yes and they believed it the entire time and you know, look what happened. So like I say, keep going. I take my hat off to you. Um, it's, a, it's, it's an amazing position to be in. So um, like I say, I'm, I'm in awe of you and I always will be. Love that very similar for me um i just again i've worked a lot with corporate brands um over the years and it's just so fun working with like startups and scale-ups it's new ideas crazy ideas um you know tech just habit changing human stuff and it's like it's yeah it's fascinating like you just you can't get bored <laughs> um and it and it is amazingly powerful kind of helping people on their journey and I think having a deep respect and I think from our the backgrounds that we've come from um, in kind of agency world and actually now feeling like we have a partnership which is really equal and that we can actually genuinely help brand scale we can we can do part of that with our expertise and we're part of the team we consider ourselves part of the team and that is for us having a good relationship working with great people working with exciting ideas that's what it's all about 
Love that. Um, yeah, so I won't go over working with the founders is one of my favorite things. Um, but actually one of the most rewarding things about my job um, is that if we aren't able to get them through the door with uh, an investor, we can cover lots of different options. And I think I mentioned at the start of one of my questions, it's VC investment isn't the only way to get your business up and running. And then, you know, you might go look for VC investment further down the line, but being able to offer different options rather than just saying, no, sorry, uh, is really rewarding. So if we say, ah, listen, we didn't get you that, but why don't you just need, you might just need your first 25K. So why don't we get you a startup loan? Or why don't we try find you a grant? And here's a competition you could go for specifically in your industry. Things like that. I, I find that really rewarding where they find a, a not a backdoor, but a, a different um way of getting there love that um well guys this brings our episode to a close um if you've enjoyed this please make sure to give this a thumbs up if you're watching on social share it with someone that you think might find useful um resources that i've been mentioned we will share um as you guys always know um we offer a lot of free events um so this thursday we've got how to budget like a boss um, that comes with a PDF complimentary that you can kind of like implement straight in your business. We've got how to get your first six figure client next week, Tuesday. Um, I hope everyone stays safe and is profitable and you will have a good evening. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.